Thank you. Your conference will begin shortly. You are being placed into conference in muted mode. Community. He's been the recipient of the Queen's Jubilee Medal in 2002, honorary citizen for the City of Victoria in 2000, Victoria's Citizen of the Year in 1994, and runner-up Victoria's Community Leader in 1993. Chris has coached and played sports for more than 40 years and enjoys reading, drinking coffee, dreaming, and spending time with his, time with his wife, Judith. So thank she you for told me to put that. <laughs> Thank you for being with us. Uh, and with us we have Bruce White, uh, who is the Cultural Tourism Advisor in the Arts and Cultural Branch with the Ministry of Be Tourism, Culture and the Arts. He has over 20 years of tourism experience and has spent most of the 1990s developing and conducting GIS-based inventories of tourism resources and tourism community studies with the Provincial Tourism Ministry and then seven years of a consultant working in community and First Nations tourism. Like many, he first entered the workforce in frontline tourism jobs as a dishwasher and a short order cook, working his way up to steward at a major hotel. Bruce holds a diploma in print journalism from Loyal Loyalist College in Bellevue, Ontario, a Bachelor's of Science in Geography from the University of Victoria, and a Master's in Environmental Education and Communication from Royal Road University. So I thank all the presenters for being with us today. Um, okay. So you can see a screen with the presenters, and we'll just move to the agenda for the session, which uh, will be a presentation from the three speakers um, for about 35 minutes, and then we'll have about 40 minutes for um, some discussion and dialogue, and with five minutes to end for closure. So I'm going to pass it over to Bruce. Thank you. Um, I'm actually going to defer to Dr. White, who's going to start this discussion by explaining a little bit about what cultural tourism is, and maybe what it isn't, and, and how we can uh, use it. You with us, Brian? Hello, Brian. Oh, Brian, um, you'll have to press star seven to unmute your line. Um, well, I'll try unmuting all the lines, so that means all the presenter or all the participants also can be heard. We'll try it. See if we can get them. The conference has been unmuted. Okay, so awesome. seven. Did that work? Hi. Um, we just unmuted all the lines for now, so we'll give that a try, and um, we'll go back to remuting if we get a lot of feedback from other lines. So you're on for now. Okay, I hope everyone can hear me. Um, I'll, I'll have to apologize for not being familiar with this technology. Uh, this is the first time I've used it, so please stay with me. Um, first of all, the, the discussion about cultural tourism and community cultural tourism is essential in BC uh, at the moment because of the transition from resource-based economies to service-based economy. Uh, it's particularly significant that economic development officers and responsible for local tourism development be aware of the role that culture and the arts plays in making sure that BC communities have viable and successful economies which are locally based, as well as economies which have the reach to attract business from a number of different, uh, right across the globe. Um, if you take a look at uh, what community-based cultural tourism is, you'll see that it ranges from very day-to-day uh, -day, uh, lifestyle activities in a community through to special major events or unique events that communities uh, host, right through to higher, you know, what we might call higher level arts and crafts and, and traditions. And they're all very variable. Each community is very unique in this, in this particular field. Um, economic development offices may or may not have tourism in their plan. Most do, but part of the issue that has come up in the province is the linkage between culture, the arts, and tourism. That linkage isn't something you can assume, and it's a role that economic development officers can and will play. The economic development officer's role, in particular, has to do with the ability to bring people together in the community to make sure that partnerships can, and alliances can build so that you can build something which is more than just the sum of the parts. 
It's about coordination. It's about product development. It's about bringing people in, about training, about education, and about importing ideas that are going to work. There's the example uh, which is listed in, in the slide in your discussion around the Juno Awards. This is a, a situation where you'd have, if we could bring the Juno Awards to Victoria, for example, you would have a, a, a major event which would have enormous spin-off benefits in, in both in short term and in the long term. So that's a, a, a very significant example, which um, Chris can speak to more than me, but I think it's something that can, in different scales and different situations, occur right across the province. Uh, if you take a look at, for example, Nanaimo, Nanaimo has uh, built in major tourism development as part of its economic development strategy, not without controversy, but certainly in a transformative way. So just to summarize this set of, of comments, the, the idea of community-based cultural tourism is about community transformation in British Columbia. It's about looking at alternative economies, building the social networks that the community has, and most importantly, working collaboratively to try to have a generator effect on economic activity and social, um, social networking, which builds the community's employment, builds its tax base, and also attracts migrants, amenity migration, into the community so that that will provide some more economic activity as well. So there's a first set of comments um, on, on this first slide. Okay, so we can move along. Uh, there's a snap quiz that's come up on the screen. Um, I think uh, what you're looking at here is uh, uh, a list of different activities, and in it you'll see things which appear to be uh, cultural and things that don't. So why don't you just uh, take a look and, and figure out as a group which, which ones might be considered to be cultural and which ones don't, aren't. And you might have some interesting uh, discussions around this particular point. Okay. Uh, so, he's cheating. Hot dogs, right? Um, so, any comments on that? Brian, I don't think we're set up for uh, a lot of discussion in the middle okay. of the presentation. Oh, yeah. Once again, I'm not totally up to speed with this particular situation. Um, I'm also not sure how we advance this, because I didn't get any advice on how to do this. Just let me uh, move it for you. Okay. Okay, let's maybe carry on to this, this next slide. Um, what is community cultural tourism? Travel to experience the authentic culture of BC's people, places, and activities as, as, a, as an overall kind of... Um, definition. If you take a look at the, the three topic areas that are in the slide, you'll see there's formal arts. Um, this is the things that most of the time we're going to identify as being typical about cultural tourism, the first two. Um, museums, heritage sites, interpretive centers, theaters, galleries, performance, uh, music, uh, you know, special, special artistic events and cultural events. Yes, I think everyone's going to get that. But the sense of place argument, I think, is worth um, is worth advancing. The the thing that we don't recognise very often is that we are, as a cultural entity, as a series of culturally based communities with particular lifestyles and attraction in itself. So um, I'm reminded that there was a, there was a sign at Whistler which which I thought was was quite interesting. It's, it was in somebody's uh, front window of somebody's house. It said, "Smile, you're a tourist attraction." And to a certain extent, that, that sums up the sense of place, that everywhere you go in the province, there's something there which is of great interest to visitors. And uh, the argument was that a good place to live is a good place to visit. And I think we'll see that comment come up later as well. Maybe next slide, please. So, as you can see, everything's ticked. Um, Bingo is a cultural heritage act. I mean, whoa, okay. But, it, you know, it's, um, it's part of the culture. It may not attract uh, a lot of overseas visitors to a bingo hall, but when you talk about culture, when you talk about sense of place, you will be talking about the bingo hall. You'll be talking about the local 
post office as a as kind of a local community site. Um, it's part of the fabric of the community, and, and culturally, uh, community um, community tourism focuses around those elements which makes the community come alive. And if the, if the community has a significant uh, number of different, it has diversity and richness, those are the things that build a sense of place and also which build business and activity for, for, for people. Do you see those? Everything from coffee shops to First Nations, First Nation canoe trips. I still remember, um, speaking, you know, of being in Haida Gwaii and visiting a fascinating coffee shop and having a very engaging conversation with the, uh, um, the server who worked there about the community. And I'll still remember that, uh, 15 years later. Um, next slide, please. So, the faces of tourism, of cultural tourism include anyone and everyone that lives in this province. First Nations cultural tourism, of course, is an essential and front and center opportunity for communities, for particularly First Nations communities throughout the province. Uh, any, any one of our, our rich diversity of, of ethnic communities, uh, those are the kinds of things that, that, that give the place richness in life. Um, as an ex-logging engineer myself, the logging and the forestry traditions which have characterized British Columbia for so long are still significant to us, They're absolutely essential. And, and yet we're looking at a, a forest industry which in many cases is not thriving the way it was, and yet the cultural traditions are still there, and, and uh, it's something we can celebrate. Next slide, please. If you take a look at this model here, you'll see the, the, the elements of uh, cultural uh, tourism which is based in communities. A critical factor that we, you all need to look, to look at in any community in the province is the, the significance of institutions and community organizations in building an alliance, building particular linkages. It, it, what you sometimes get is a, a silo effect in which um, operators do not speak to uh, up small businesses, you don't get chambers of commerce engaged as much as they could with business associations, with economic development, and I would suggest that the community part of this particular uh, model which you're looking at right now is actually one of the absolutely critical components. Municipalities, elected officials can provide an amazingly strong uh, leadership role in building uh, the linkage between culture and tourism. And one of the things that is really important to recognize is that there are different cultures in culture and tourism and in community organizations. Each one has its own set of values and beliefs. And part of the problem that we have to overcome is that uh, cultural organizations may not see tourism as being something that they want to be close to or involved in, especially in communities that have one or two larger, you know, significant attractions or events, that, that are kind of hallmarks. Very often there's, a, there's a, a sense that the connectivity isn't there, and in fact you don't really want to have these other people involved because it isn't going to improve things. The reality is that successful communities tend to be those communities in which there are community champions. There are people from whichever sector it is who step forward and they bring people together to work on it. If you look at the center of this circle, you've got the visitor or the resident. And this goes back to the good place to, to live is a good place to visit idea. And that is that as time goes on, we're not going to see as much of a distinction between what the visitor wants and what the resident wants. Um, if you take a look at, did you, sorry, hello. Hello, okay. this is Alberta government calling. The meeting. Okay. All right. Okay. If you look in the middle of the circle, you'll see the visitor or resident. The visitor is a person who eventually, in many cases in British Columbia, moves here or they move to the community. So a tourist is a person who may be on a on a pathway to actually investing and moving and to live in a place. And with depopulation happening in many parts of the province, that's something we need to be involved with. So that circle, the center of the circle, the visitor of the resident, is the person who is the, the, the beneficiary of the linkages and the partnerships that these three groups put together. You'll see there are provincial organizations there, like Council of Tourism Associations, uh, uh, Aboriginal Tourism Association of BC. Um, these are people that can provide a supporting role, but really it's about the community organizations that pull people together, um, um, 
I think uh, I, I know Yvonne Black uh, is, on, is, is involved here um, in, in uh, Souk, and that's a, that's a, she's a person who I think is an example of making things happen by providing that community-level organization. And there's several other people on the list who do the same. Next slide, please. So here we've got the numbers piece. Um, economics, 1.4 billion. Now, the critical thing about this is where do the, does the money land? We've got a lot of um, billions of children revenues, but a lot of that is concentrated in the golden triangle. It's between Vancouver, Victoria, and Whistler. The issue in, cultural, in community cultural tourism is to get economic benefit moved into smaller communities and spread throughout the province. That is the essential economic driver for uh, community-based cultural tourism. And one of the other elements to make that happen is the differentiation that each community can bring to the table, whether it's culinary tourism, if you're looking at adventure or ecotourism, you're looking at um, wine, wine tour routes and this kind of thing. The major thing is getting those FTEs up, getting those jobs in, in place, and making sure that people can live in the community and, and make a decent living by diversification, and this is one of the best ways of doing that. There's so many different spin-offs that happen which affect the quality of life. There's a very, very large number of benefits. The benefits include increasing the level of investment in a region and in a community. Absolutely essential. Next slide, please. Okay. Um, we've got a situation now where you've got baby boomers looking to move to nice places to live. Okay, immunity. Uh, if you want to see an example of a place which is a classic of this and which has had some problems as a result, look at Salt Spring Island. You've got 52% of the population there is retired. You think that has an effect on the politics of the island? You bet it does. Now, community-based cultural tourism also tends to attract small entrepreneurs, people that want to start a business or have uh, downsize and move to a different lifestyle. Well, guess what? Salt Spring Island has the same thing. So what you, set, you tend to get is a situation in which many of the, um, the activities that you see in British Columbia have to do with uh, people who have chosen a lifestyle and want to make a living and, and cultural children. If you have the right um, economic strategies, you have the right bylaws, you have the right incentives and the right economic um, in direction for a community, you can attract that group. Older, village, older visitors absolutely are looking for cultural heritage, the baby boomers, the empty nesters, their people have got money. Um, the experience economy says that lifestyle uh, is, is important and cultural tourism offers that range of stories that you can tell about your life that is lacking very often if you, if you just look at standard um, standard mass tourism. So we're starting to see a lot of niches develop and a lot of communities are going into that particular direction as well. Next slide, please. Um, if you take a look here, um, you'll see the demographic range. Um, I'm getting a bit long in the tooth myself and in my early years I was kayaking, mountaineering, a lot of biking and that sort of thing, are now very much into gardening, wine, and culinary experiences because I'm over 60. So if you take a look at the product characteristics and the, and the, the movement over, a, over lifestyle and the, the preferences that people have for products, you want to be in a place where you're going to have a range of attractiveness across the whole lifespan, but you've got to recognize that cultural tourism does attract very often the mon a moneyed, um, older, demographic, and that's a really critical piece. So smaller communities who want to attract that particular market segment and get the benefits of that are well advised to focus on developing cultural partnerships and products which will hit that particular market because it's a market that will spend money. Very, we have a dip in the middle. We have a um, a situation where uh, the younger demographic is much smaller and we haven't got strategies in place in the province yet yet to attract that younger demographic uh, so it's a, falling, uh, it's a falling market. I think we will. I think it will turn around, but it's going to take a lot of time and effort to do that. Next slide, please. So if you take a look at, the, the, at this, this list here, or the, the, the graph, um, 
can see that one of the, the things that's hit us is that over and above the aging of the baby boom, we've also had a number of critical events which have affected travel. Obviously, the uh, situation we've had with the United States, the thickening border, the increase in the Canadian dollar, all those things we all know about SARS, um, uh, 9-11, all of those kinds of events, one after the other over the last few years, have significantly changed the character, shape, and feel of tourism in B.C. The domestic tourism has become far more important to us. It's a really critical factor. We're still seeing issues with long haul around things like volcanoes going off. Um, we're seeing uh, increasing costs for fuel, and fuel is probably going to be one of the things which will push us significantly uh, in the post-Olympic phase into an approach which looks at attracting a range of domestic um, northern tier states, uh, Alberta, uh, uh, Lower Mainland. We're looking at that market. One of the things we're going to have to see is an increase in our total population, to to which match which will match and support um, community cultural tourism. And I think I think the, the shift towards community-based cultural tourism is going to address that particular opportunity of a, a domestic aging domestic market. Next slide, please. Okay, so we know that uh, the older traveler is, is, is got uh, very often better educated, they've got more money. They are, in fact, traveling to spend their children's inheritance, which is what I intend to do in a couple of years with a bit of luck. So if that's the case, then you want to make sure that you've got a range of opportunities which will allow the older traveler to have stories to have the experiences which will make life richer and more significant. The direct experience marketplace is something that cultural tourism can do. In small communities, you can get hallmark events, smaller scale, niche oriented, marketed through web, uh, through the web and through other media means, which really, really works well. And that's something that I, I'm starting to see. Um, also, a well uh, reconstituted, a, 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 a downtown core, a small, even if it's very small, can make a huge difference in attractive, attracting that particular market. So um, that particular group of people is looking for quality, and they're willing to spend to get it. Next slide, please. Okay, so let's talk a bit about authenticity. Um, authenticity has to do with the state of being perceived to be real. To be uh, authentic is to have a sense of reality about what you're doing. Um, it's, it's a very important component in terms of the richness of a place as a destination. So a destination that has authenticity is a place that's going to be more livable because of the fact that there's a greater sense of place. So place has to do with the idea that you're living somewhere or visiting somewhere that has meaning. So meaning is about the experience that we mentioned in the last last slide. It's about the idea that you are able to come away with something that has meaning and significance in your life. So sense of place is about build is been a culture builder. So economic development officers in particular can, if they have that perce perception, can be culture builders for a destination. So that's a critical factor. Vancouver certainly, I think the example of Vancouver is a very, very good one because Vancouver set out to build that cultural identity. Uh, many other communities in BC have done the, have done the same, uh, and I think that's um, th that's something we can all share and we can all learn from. And it will be different um, if you're in Port McNeil. It's going to be different than if you're in the East Kootenays or uh, if you're up north. But there's something there which will work. So that's an important element. Next slide, please. Right. Okay. So uh, this looks like uh, Quasimoto, I think. Um, so, what are you actually trying to come out in terms of social and economic opportunities and, and contributions? Well, one of the things we've, we've dealt with is, is aging infrastructure and uh, neighborhoods. Uh, we've got situations where neighborhoods uh, which are going downhill need stabilizing. They need to be uh, uh, put into a situation in which there is investment coming in where property values start to increase and improve, um, 
those are kinds of things that really make a difference in whether a community has long-term sustainability or not. If you want to talk about the cultural tourism opportunities and cultural development, talk to real estate people. They are really interesting because the real estate market is always watching the property values of a place. And property values are driven by uh, whether or not a place has amenity value. If it has amenity value, that means that the place itself is a desirable destination. And, and sometimes those can be uh, for the most unusual reasons. Um, one of the things also that you want to make sure is that you've got enough thriving businesses, small, medium, or, or large, in the community that you don't have to have the economy draining away. If you have a community which simply becomes a commuter destination, an next urbanite community where everyone leaves town and goes to work somewhere else, that's a, that's a major problem because you're not getting investment back from the residents back into the community. So reducing economic leakage for a variety of different sources is important. Pride and identity, absolutely critical. If you have pride in a place, if you have a sense of that the place is really special to you, though that kind of drive can get people involved in building attractive, uh, valuable, high-quality types of landscapes in those urban, urban um, uh, environments. They protect the landscape that is around the community, and there's a sense that the community itself is worth a lot. It's a place where you can invite people to visit because you're proud of it. And you can see this in many communities around the province. In other places, it just doesn't happen. So that's a really critical piece. Um, so what are, we, what are we saying about the, the civic pride piece? Well, people in BC move around. You're going to get people moving to new locations and investing in new homes as a, as a, after they have traveled there some, for some time. You're starting to see people moving, for example, to Euclid. You're seeing people moving to communities further north. Um, you're seeing places that are being, uh, seeing a boom in investment and in, um, in, in new residents coming in because the amenity value has been built through the official community plan and through economic development planning. And I would suggest those two pieces working together are an essential foundation for any municipality or regional district that wants to actually see themselves transition into a full-scale service-based economy in the province. And in some places that's happened, but there's lots of parts of the province where it simply isn't happening yet. And I think that's a really important thing. So uh, next slide, please. So I think that's as far as I was supposed to go, wasn't it, Bruce? Yeah, that's right. Thank you, Brian. Okay. Thank you. So, folks, this, uh, this quiz number two, um, basically, we're uh, we're asking you whether you, any of those things have ever, if, if culture has done any of those things for your town, and you'll see in the follow-up questionnaire that comes out after this, we're quite serious in asking. We'd like to know how has culture helped your time because we'd like your town, um, if you know of examples of that. Okay, thanks. So I'm going to carry on from where Brian has established what cultural tourism is and why it's a good thing and something about what it's... Uh, what it's good for. I'm going to mention, I'm going to start talking about how do we turn this to commercial advantage? How do we get some economic value out of this good thing? And as Brian's touched on, a lot of it has to do not only with the direct economic benefits, but also the indirect things that it provides in terms of enhancing the quality of life in your community, which leads to the mobility of businesses and industry. It helps uh, companies, individual companies and, and, and uh, individual business people and companies decide that your town is a good place to live because it's got those amenity values, a good place to live. And as uh, Dr. White has said famously, a good place to live is a good place to visit. That's the theory that we've adopted in working for this uh, community cultural tourism strategy and the approach the province has taken is that we recognize that working on this file can help make our towns better to live in as well as better places to visit. So one of the things that happens is as we form our identity in our communities, as we become uh, as we become proud of being a West Coaster or a person from the Kootenays or a person from the North, as we shape our town's identities, uh, this helps us determine who we are as communities and citizens, but it also helps us pr uh, produce our tourism brand. And that's the image that we put out to outsiders. That's the image we project 
to the world outside and say, here we are, come and love us, this is a great place to visit. So we need to found that on something. And what's it founded on? It's based on the beauty of our natural location and the special characteristics of the people who live here. Next, please. So traditionally, British Columbia has um, used to have uh, a, an approach that was very closely tied to the, the spectacular nature of our wonderful province. We, we adopted the brand Supernatural BC back when Grace McCarthy was Minister of Tourism. Um, that phrase, I've been led to believe, actually came about because the minister at the time recognized the beauty of our nature, but she felt that culture was the super part in it. Well, that's anecdotal. I don't know that for a fact, but I, I believe that to be true. Yeah. So I'm showing you here a, a, a newspaper advertisement from 1967, and there's, uh, there's a performance group doing something, and you can see some mountains in the background. And traditionally, British Columbia marketed itself with a focus on the the three M's. Next slide, I'd like you to think for a second. What are the three M's of traditional tourism marketing in British Columbia? Just take a second to have a look at that list, and we'll get to the answer in a second. Okay, move on. It's not that big of a joke. I'm sure many of you know that it's mountains, moose, and mountains. They're the traditional images that BC once on used. We've actually moved on from that quite a bit, and uh, the latest iteration of adjustments and enhancements and evolution in our tourism marketing brand are very interesting, um, and particularly interesting to those of us working in cultural tourism because what's happened is that the marketing wizards, the people who are experts in this stuff, have come to the same conclusion we have that culture is a key driver for the emerging markets in tourism. They're putting more emphasis on, on what I'm calling the super and supernatural DC. Next, please. Uh, I should mention, with all the modern technology, I had to reproduce a, an ad in black and white because I couldn't scan it in color. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, our tourism brand, the way they go about this is they figure out who are they talking to and look at the characteristics of the kinds of people that they're talking to, the markets they're trying to bring to British Columbia. They're looking for people who live life youthfully, people who are reaching out and touching life and being engaged in the things that make our place special. And you'll notice they say engage in culture or activities that energize the mind, body, and soul. That's because in British Columbia, sometimes it's kind of difficult to separate culture from nature. If you and a bunch of friends go climb a mountain, is that a natural event or is it a cultural event because you're doing it with friends? We won't worry about the distinction. We'll just try and take advantage of the opportunity. Okay, next slide, please. Um, the other thing about our brand is that they're appealing to the market on two fronts. One is rational and the other is emotional. And it's important in marketing that you use both the logical arguments and the emotive arguments that reach right in the back of your brain and grab you by the, by the back of the scruff of the neck. We're pushing the, the natural beauty, but we're also acknowledging our cultural diversity, which is kind of a new thing for us, and the wealth of activities that we have. So two years ago, the minister then, uh, then of my ministry and now of uh, Ministry of Community and Rural Development, uh, Bill Bennett, decided that we should look into this cultural tourism thing, and he asked us to prepare a provincial strategy for cultural tourism. Um, which we did. We conducted re background research. We formed an expert advisory group that uh, advised us on how to go about the process to make sure that it was reflecting the interests of the stakeholders and that it was reflecting the latest thinking in all of this. Uh, we went all around the province and talked to people, and I noticed from the list of folks that are taking part in this conference call, um, several of you have been part of that consultation. Uh, and then from that, we developed a, a draft strategic approach. Next slide. The strategic approach recommended actions in six different areas. And these, are, these are ways we can get at making cultural tourism provide a greater contribution to our communities. So the first one, and one that we consider to be critical, is working on figuring out ways to work together. This is the part that Brian was talking about. Uh, around the role of economic development officers who have the capacity to pull together the players in their community who are involved in this particular kind of economic development activity. We also have to provide information so that people can demonstrate why cultural tourism is a good idea, 
what culture and what tourism are doing for their communities and demonstrate the case, make it in, in both in terms of economics and those other non-economic uh, non values I mentioned. We have to do some stuff to help develop products. We have to find ways to help people create the experiences and products that are going to attract visitors. Another one that always comes up is to get the government the heck out of the way so that people can go on about their business. We also have to support marketing. And as always with government work, we need to do some evaluation so we can determine if we're going about this properly. So when we started developing this strategy, excuse me, <coughs> times were fairly good, and they actually had a few bucks in the kitty for us to roll this out. Between now and then, um, world economic meltdown happened, and uh, my kitty got raided <laughs> such that um, we were challenged to find a way to go about implementation, um, well, to put it bluntly, with no money. And the, the result, the way we came up with doing this is to work with communities in pilot projects uh, using what we've called a low-key implementation path. So rather than rolling out a big provincial program with uh, grant applications and funding and that sort of thing, what we're going to try and do is figure out how to do this by working with individual communities and then trusting that the world economy turns around, money is available, then we'll be able to support a, a broader program. Next slide, please. So the pilot projects are basically projects where the local community is already doing something and they ask me to come in and offer a bit of advice and technical support. Um, critical to this is that um, my bosses have made me say, going into every one of these processes, that there is no commitment to fund anything. We will, of course, look at any proposals that come out of, of these kinds of processes, but there's no advanced commitment. This can be annoying to the communities, but then when we mention that, uh, well, once you've got a plan in place, you'll be able to make a stronger case for your funding application, it seems to make some sense. Um, four of the main projects that we're working on right now are in, in Campbell River, where the community suffered some mill shutdowns and, and has had a real difficult time. And in that community, we've, we've got the Arts Alliance and, and all the different business folks together. And we've come up with a short-term strategy where we're basically going to package together the special events that that community already does. And we're going to put a, we're going to wrap them up with a bow, put a big ad out on it, and make a big to-do out of these, the events that they've got, and use that as a way to leverage moving forward. They have, they have some big plans for the future, but those are big infrastructure projects. And in terms of talking about what are we going to do by this summer, we're not going to be building multi-million dollar facilities in time for that. So we had to come up with that, a strategy that would let us make the most of what we already have in place. Over in Grand Forks, in Sydney, the issue is a little bit different. Um, same kinds of problems with shutdowns and, and reductions in traditional resource industries. Um, but the folks there uh, don't have as solid an organizational structure for tourism management in place. And so they're, they're looking at forming a regional chamber of commerce that can take on uh, tourism marketing and development for not just Grand Forks, but Green, uh, Greenwood, Midway, and Christina Lake as well, the boundary country area. And that's a really good idea. That's got these small communities who would have a heck of a time doing anything on their own. By working together, they've got the horsepower to get something done. Over in Souk, they've begun the process of mapping their cultural values and we'll be developing a cultural plan and then we hope from that we'll go on to develop a cultural tourism plan that'll look at how we can use the cultural assets in an appropriate way to develop commercial opportunities. Up in the Alaska Highway where uh, April Moy and the folks at RCC Tourism are trying to get that uh, that route, that route designated as a scenic byway and a, and a historic place. And uh, so we did some work to compile an inventory of all the good things that they've got up there. Uh, the Alaska Highway is an interesting one because, of course, it was built in World War II to, to get war supplies to Alaska. Uh, ever since one of the main customer bases using that route have been ex-American servicemen and their families going to visit the scene of dad or grandpa's wartime greatness, well, those folks are now very much uh, too old to be traveling, 
and so this this area is thinking about recreating themselves in a way that's relevant to modern people and uh, that, that, that makes more sense and can draw visitors from further away. And a big part of that is probably going to be connected to their contemporary culture, the culture of the oil patch, the culture of their agriculture out there, and the culture of their First Nations folks. Okay, thanks. Let's go next. So after we did this, this strategy and came up with some ideas, uh, we saw that there were some things that needed to happen to follow up on it. One large, one large block of work that we can think about doing is stuff that... The conference has been out. muted. Um, we have, now that Tourism British Columbia has been brought into the Ministry of Tourism, Culture and the Arts, uh, we have access to the people who look after marketing, the people who run the visitor information centers, the people who do the Hello BC website, the people who work with the travel trade. All of these exciting technical specialists who are really among the world's best at this kind of stuff are now available to us to help. And so I'm running around trying to convince my colleagues that uh, on top of everything else we're doing, they should add this to the work list. And amazingly, most of them are very keen to help in spite of heavy workloads. They're saying this is a good thing and it want, it, it's worthy of further attention. Um, many of the other things that we want to look at, though, involve working with outside partners, and I've listed here the Ministry of Community and Rural Development as a special friend because they deal primarily with the smaller rural communities outside of the Lower Mainland, and uh, they have people, which is you economic development folks, on the ground there who can work with us on this kind of thing. And then as the chart that Brian showed you mentioned, there's a whole, other, there's a whole bunch of other partners that we need to work with in each community to try and develop these ideas. When you look at how people take plans for tourism development and, and turn them into reality, um, there are a number of different um, vehicles that are used. They have, uh, and you'll see the, the different stacks there, a standalone tourism unit, formal council committee member, a city councillor, economic development. Those are, <laughs> I beg your pardon, I've gotten a touch of the flu. Those are different ways, yeah, Chris moves away. Um, those are different ways that people can incorporate tourism planning into their community planning in a bigger sense. And so when you have a special tourism unit, not surprisingly, there's quite a lot of um, uh, the tourism planning goes into that sector. But if you think about, does the Chamber of Commerce do tourism planning? Well, as you can see by the purple stack in the Chamber of Commerce, yes, they do a fair amount. Uh, when you look at... Uh, uh, some of the other areas, like economic development, tourism gets a pretty good recognition, which to me is excellent because it means that ECDEV officers are, are becoming aware of the opportunity. And we just want you to be aware that there are different kinds of ways to go about implementing this stuff and that it's important to where you can to work with all of those. Okay, next. Move it along, the, the timekeeper saying. Okay, so we'll go fairly quickly here. There, there, are, uh, there are a number of things that local government can do We've listed five. The one I want to bring to your attention here is the idea of integrating tourism and economic development. Um, I've been involved with uh, a number of ECDEV officers around the province over the last 20 years, and interestingly, some of them recognize tourism as part of the economic development toolkit that's available to them to, to help their community. Some others don't seem to see it, and I'm not sure if this is because in British Columbia, we very typically, we've been thinking about the next sawmill, we've been thinking about the next pulp mill, we've been thinking about a cogen plant or some such resource-based thing, and we, we maybe haven't given full credence to the opportunities that tourism presents. Tourism doesn't give you as many high-paying jobs as a new sawmill will, but tourism is not only mixed jobs. There are good jobs in tourism. There are jobs managing. There are jobs operating businesses. There are jobs providing content that are well-paying, good, interesting jobs. And so I urge you, as you're developing economic plans in your communities, to please integrate tourism and make it part of that. Okay. The, some of the tools that we've, we've looked at connect to uh, Ministry of Community and, and Rural Development, and, and in particularly this, this has to do with things like building this stuff into official community plans uh, and looking at your community first agreements. And above all, ECDEV officers uh, wind up being involved in these projects where someone has a great idea to build a something. And I urge you, every time somebody says, let's build a something, that 
you think about how can tourism fit into that something that you're building. Next, please. So if you're going to think about how to use community cultural tourism as part of your economic development, uh, I'd urge you to think about this checklist. It's a pretty straightforward planning kind of an approach. It talks about getting together the players, and, and we've listed a kind of list of all those players. Conduct an inventory, figure out who you're trying to sell to, figure out what you've got to sell to them, and then match what you're selling to what the market wants to make sure these things line up. Make adjustments as required, and then run your products and test, evaluate to see how well you've done it, and then again, adjust as required. Thank you. Next. Now, the, the charge to, to those of you that are economic development officers is it includes these things. And, and one that, that I think falls into your bailiwick is the idea of demonstrating the value of tourism in your community. Um, many communities are not aware of how much tourism does for their town in terms of creating jobs and adding to the economy. There are some additional values that are really important in smaller communities. For instance, um, I lived in Hazleton for a couple of years. We had seven restaurants in Hazleton. We would only have had one if it wasn't for tourism. So thanks to the tourists, I had a choice of Chinese or a deli. And in a small town, that choice is really important. It's, it's hard to hold on to your facilities and you want to do that. Tourism can help you do it. Um, use that information to educate your people about the opportunities. Your role as ActDev guys, I think, uh, a key part of that role is this thing about bringing the partners together to start thinking about the problems. Keep community culture tourism in your mind as you're developing projects, and then think about structures that will have this, uh, will help you work this out and, and implement it to make it so. Next, please. So this is the quiz that we uh, will we'll be asking you to to give us your other ideas. I'm hoping that by this point you recognize that the first five items are the ones I just told you about, what we'd like to see, and we'll ask you in the follow-up survey, if you think there are other things that economic development officers can do to help community cultural tourism. And we're asking this in all honesty because we're not economic development officers. You guys know what you can do, and if you can help us understand what you can do, we can make it better. Next, please. So. Now we're going to talk about a, a particular case, an example of a project that brings, uh, brings cultural tourism to a community, and that'll be Councillor Coleman's turn to talk. Thank you, sir. Um, just so you understand my background, when I was doing my MBA now 13 or 14 years ago, my thesis or my case study involved international tourism development, focusing on how you can engage and enliven inner harbors. I was doing it at the University, University of Victoria, and downtown became the, the perfect uh, focus for that. And I don't take any credit for what was a very good project. My two classmates, uh, Sarah Shasko and Allison Pierce, did all the heavy lifting. Sarah was your classmate? Sarah was my classmate. Um, and we did very well. It focused, among other components, on the development of a tall ship festival. Five years later, I was the interim ED of the Maritime Museum of British Columbia, and the American sail training people came in and said, we'd like to bring a tall, fest, a tall ships festival here. And I went, you're kidding. I happen to have my thesis. And again, I don't take any credit for the development of the tall ships festival in 2005 and again in 2008, and it's now in planning process in 2011. But I recognize that these opportunities occur. So it's an iterative process that communities draw on to develop products. And about a year ago, a friend of mine phoned me in Victoria and said, I know that a few years ago you were looking at a Juno's bid. I have just finished working on the Juno's in Vancouver, incredibly successful. I think Victoria should think about a bid process for 2013, perhaps 2014, 2015. And you need to understand some of the impacts and some of the uh, drawbacks and some of the uh, costs that will be associated with this, my partner and I would happily do a, a small contract to lead you through that process if you can pitch around and find a couple of local organizations to pay for it. The Provincial Capital Commission and the Downtown Business Improvement Area came forward and said, yeah, we can fund that. And we started the process with a small group of uh, focus groups, uh, just 
three or four people, about eight of them, and at one of those focus groups, Bruce was, who happens to be a neighbor of mine. So as soon as it got into the public small world, yeah, it is a small world, Bruce said, well, you know, I worked on the Junos bit in Vancouver and, and the implementation. I think Victoria could do, but there are some hurdles we have to get over. So we did a series of small focus groups with the business community, the tourism community, some members of government at different levels, and most importantly, the arts community, who at that point were going through some um, cuts, and they were concerned that a new product coming on board would just suck up what was left of their funding. So one of our original principles was, in order to make a Juno's bid work, we will move forward with brand new funding. We'll find it somehow. We'll be creative about this, but it's about bringing people together. The benefits from Vancouver, um, it happens in March or April. For a week, it used to, the Junos used to be a, a weekend event. It's now spread. It's become five to six nights. It probably looks as though it's going to encapsulate two weekends. So it's a fairly big event. Vancouver saw 5,200, 5,200 room nights booked in their hotels in four days. They used multiple sites. Uh, they blocked off three blocks of Granville Street and engaged the public to come to free events. And that's how you got political buy-in for a Vancouver council that was split between the, a left and right political reality. They wanted both the high-end cultural opportunities and the free community base. So there were ways of, of doing that. They spread the activities, as I said, over a number of nights, a number of different types of products. So we all recognize the... Sunday evening event that we see on television that just recently happened in St. John's, Newfoundland, and drew a viewership of about 1.6 million people. Um, but that's the tip of the iceberg. There's a whole range of other products um, that include the Aboriginal community uh, from across the country that talk about a songwriters festival that engage the public. And one of the greatest benefits that comes is not the economic impact, but the mandate from the people that own the Juno's product, which is Keras, the Canadian Association of Recording Artists and Sciences, and they demand that 50% of all music talent during the week of Juno's is local. So we're now in the process of building a team. If we wish to bid for 2013, we have to have our, uh, all our ducks in order by April 2011. So it's a two-year, right? If we want to go for 2014, we've got a little more time to work on it. It hasn't come to any of the local political tables because this has to be seen as a regional opportunity, and I would argue uh, it's a tourism issue. We actually have to present ourselves as the capital regional district of the province, and we're to present particularly the talent of Vancouver Island, but in fact the musical talent of the, of the province of British Columbia. <coughs> so how do we get into that? Well, we started by trying to leverage the public um, and we did a fairly quick and dirty uh, com uh, website survey, and we were hoping for 250 to 350 responses. We got about 550, and I think 96% of them were saying, yeah, giddy up, get on with it. Why are you even asking us? Let's, this is critically important. There is a recognition that this region has all sorts of musical talent in a number of different genres, if we lack anything, it may be our sense of self-assuredness. We actually don't think that we can play on the larger uh, vista of, of Canada or, in fact, internationally. And I would argue that there are probably still some people locally who don't think we can actually pull off a Commonwealth Games game. In fact, we did that very successfully. But I think that's true of a lot of small communities, and uh, Dr. White earlier said it's critically important that we broaden this out through the province. There is an issue of confidence and self-assuredness for small communities moving forward with big events. And I think that that's one of the things we will hopefully have some discussion about. Um, and I'm aware that time is tight and you want to develop some conversation. So can I move you to the next? Um, I think you have to recognize a, a dual reality. You sell big events by talking about economic impact. What you really have to do is engage the other side. So that's the easy one. We know that a Juno's bid, including funding properly an organizing committee and paying for the bid process, is one and three-quarter to two million dollars. 
to cross it out. We know that there, if we can get 5,200 plus room nights in Victoria in March, there is all sorts of direct spending and multiplied spending in the area um, that will easily top the $9.1 million seen on the screen by all of you. Um, but that's not, that's how you sell it. The more important issue, I think, is the investment in local arts and culture, not by splitting down their budgets so they're funding something else, but by finding new creative opportunities to fund it. And you then think about the other realities. I would hope that if we're successful in hosting a Juno, we actually develop a uh, business incubator for new talent to be taken to market. And that's what we have seen in other areas where Music BC, for example, developed a satellite office in Kelowna. Kelowna. Yeah. Um, I think those are the critical things on the going forward basis. When we do big events, we look at the downstream benefits, not the immediate benefits. Next one, please. So uh, exactly, we remember why we're doing this. Um, I'm not a musician, except perhaps in the shower or in a large group when we're all singing, which usually implies there's some beer. Um, but we're doing this because it's, one, economically sellable. We can get funders involved because there's some tangible benefit that can be seen. More importantly, it's what else can we bring to the table? I would argue that the south end of Vancouver Island is an incredibly vibrant place for musical talent. They need a showcase opportunity to show that to the rest of the world. And by bringing all sorts of people in the music industry to Victoria, to the south end of the island, we can show their wares the best. I will admit to some um, enlightened self-interest, I guess. There, something is incredibly giddy in my mind about inviting the rest of the country here in March or April when we watched what happened in Saskatoon three years ago and it was freezing and cold and we watched um, the engagement of the public in Parkas in St. John's a couple of weeks ago and we could put on golf tournaments. I think there's something that... Um, Perhaps that borders on evil, I don't know, but it, is part of, again. but it is part of the quality of life that this region can offer, and we can do it as well as presenting the talents of the province. I'll let that be a, an opening for a future discussion. Okay, so we'll just wrap up with a final exam for you, ladies and gentlemen, students. Um, having listened to us go through all this stuff, I wonder if you think... Uh, if you could answer those questions, I think you'll you'll uh, you'll see you'll have seen them before, and I hope that the answers are fairly logical for you. The content has been unmuted. Okay, and then the uh, resources screen. So here we've got, uh, and you've all got access to this PowerPoint, so you can you don't have to write this down. You can get it later. But there are there are four resources that that we think are uh, really essential for people that are thinking about developing community cultural tourism products or that are thinking of getting into this or as act dev officers if you're a referring client. Um, the top one of those is a book, uh, a handbook. It's, it's, um, it's, not, it's not a great big fat one. It's a, it's a thin book. It's usable. It's user friendly. It's a good one. Um, put out by Link <laughs> Um, <laughs> well, as soon as I say textbook, you know, people's faces drop. Oh, no, 300 pages of boredom. This one's actually quite bright, and it's very user-friendly, and it helps walk you through the process. Of how can I plan for tourism that's going to benefit my community, and how do I root it in the stuff that my community's got? How do I root it in the values that my community holds? Uh, so I recommend that one highly. A Guide for Tourism Business Entrepreneurs and the Tourism Business Essentials are two publications of our ministry that uh, you can find online, and they're, they're basic introductions to the business. And uh, Community Tourism Foundations is a program that my ministry has uh, that helps communities do planning for uh, tourism in general and cultural tourism specifically. Okay, so that gets us to the end of the prepared portion of our program. And just to remind everybody as we start this discussion, especially if you join late, the top right-hand corner, there's a green box. And if you have a question, you can change that to purple. And
and then we'll address you by name, and then you can pose your question because the lines are now unmuted. So go ahead uh, if you have questions for any of our three presenters. Also, uh, Jennifer, I saw you typed a question in. Um, our presenters can address this question at the end of the webinar, or if you'd like to pose it now, feel free to ask away regarding agritourism. She's doing it purple. That she's asking a question. Yeah. Do I answer it, or yeah, well, go ahead, Jennifer. Or did you want to? Did you want to repeat it? Um, sure. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. Great. Um, actually, I actually have a couple of questions, and, and first of all, thank you very much for uh, for all the information. Uh, I work for an organization called Small Business BC, which deals uh, with 47 regions around British Columbia, uh, helping small business. And this is a, a very um, this is a topic of conversation for looking at art, culture, and uh, economic development and small business. Um, my first question is: Can you define agrotourism for me? and uh, maybe give us some examples of that, and or is that just a buzzword? Um, no, the agricultural sector has actually uh, defined itself under um, Experiences BC, and there is uh, there are some folks that are working on that. Generally, it has to do with providing experiences for people to view the growing, harvesting, and processing of food. Um, there's probably a more technical definition available somewhere, and I can go and see if I can find that for you, Jennifer. Um, if I could help, this is Andy Akron here in the Northeast. Hey, Andy. Um, agritourism uh, throughout uh, Canada, what they do is they offer tours of farms. Um, they um, get people to actually, you know, take holidays on farms, um, get them to, you know, experience the farm life. However, that's the good news. The bad news is a lot of countries, uh, if you've ever checked um, when you're coming back from somewhere, uh, overseas or whatever, they have a little box thing. Have you ever visited a farm? Uh, countries like Germany, who are organic, if uh, you check I've been on a farm and you can't, and don't have any certification uh, that that farm has been organic, uh, you will actually be quarantined until you can show that that farm was organic. And that happened to some tourists about two years ago. There was about 14 of them. Uh, that visited some farms in Alberta. They did an agritourism tour. And we're actually quarantined for about a week in Germany until um, all kinds of government agencies had to get their act together and prove that uh, the farms that they had visited in Alberta were organic. So uh, it is all about going out there and experiencing um, farms and seeing what they do, but you have to be careful when you do that to make sure that the right farms are participating. Maybe I can chime in on this. Um, one of the things that's happened in agritourism, it's the expansion of farming to tourism uh, by definition. And if you take a look around Victoria and the regional district, you'll see a large number of farms and farm properties, like properties, small holdings, which have expanded to serve the domestic market. So, for example, Ragley Farm out in East Souk has uh, weekend uh, markets and is very much in the agritourism business, but it's very much for residents that are coming out there. It's more for excursionists. Uh, the other end of the spectrum, of course, is woofers working on organic farms, and uh, that's that's another aspect of it as well, which is actually marketed quite heavily internationally. Jennifer, did that answer your question? Uh, yeah, that's great. Actually, it was uh, sheep farming in Clearwater that brought up the question, and, and I really appreciate that um, that piece on the uh, quarantine. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Um, Ray, I see that you have a question. Feel free to ask. Yeah, um, I was just wondering, besides the resources that were listed, I was just wondering if there are any uh, resources or workshops designed to help uh, enlighten businesses and how they might be able to uh, uh, participate and maybe squeeze more out of um, events in their community. And Specifically, my question is, is based out of uh, our own situation where we have uh, our Grizzfest Music Festival, uh, our Emperor's Challenge uh, Half Marathon Mountain Run, where um, there, seems, uh, there seems to be a, uh, almost a lack of presence or participation from the businesses, and uh, uh, we're 
sometimes not profits in our own communities, so we'd like from time to time to bring facilitators in for that sort of thing. So I was just wondering if uh, anyone knew of any, uh, like I said, resources or workshops that, you know, might be focused on that subject. Well, there's, if you look at the first, you notice the resources that Bruce listed, Transforming Communities Through Tourism, the hand, Handbook for Community Tourism Champions, that, that particular um, workbook actually came out of a series of workshops which it, we had offered around the province. So there is a workshop, it's just a matter of getting enough demand to actually have us put it on. And this is put on by Link BC in partnership with the ministry. And uh, it's something that could be, you know, it's an excellent workshop, I think. Okay, look, I'm biased. I helped write it, all right? But still, you know, it's got exactly what you're looking for in terms of actually building that uh, that, that capacity in communities. Then there's a community foundations program from the ministry as well. And if I can offer this, um, there's some work by Luis Matino on opinion leadership. I, just so you understand, I did the community development marketing for Milestones, uh, restaurants for 15 years. I, I think I was on a six-month trial basis for about 16 years. Um, because I was on a trial basis, they didn't fund me very well, and I had to go out and do all sorts of community development partnerships. When you want to get local businesses in, you have to show them a payback. If it's restaurants, they like immediate payback. The different sectors will require different things. But it's about creating that uh, the vibrancy of the economic relationship that then sells the, the partnering opportunity. And so it's all about opinion, leadership, marketing, and understanding how that works. So you might want to do some reading on that. That's not specific, but general. Finally, Ray, I think that if, uh, if you'd like to send us a, a request for something like that, I'll see if I can find the right kind of person to come and, and do a workshop with you. Thank you. Great. And uh, Pat Deacon. Do you have a question? Uh, thanks very much. Really appreciate the opportunity to uh, um, hear and learn about this. When you talk about the uh, provincial strategy, uh, you uh, one of the six areas that uh, you're working in is uh, providing foundational information. Could you talk a bit about uh, what that is and how we access that? Sure. Um, one of the things that's been an issue up to now is that we, those of us who have been working around cultural tourism, community cultural tourism, have, have been pretty sure that it's a good thing, but it's been difficult to demonstrate how and why. In part, this is because the definition of cultural tourism is a little bit slippery and variable. Um, however, what we have to do is to be able to show this, and, and there's some work that's been done internationally by the OECD, there's some work that's been done nationally by the Canadian Tourism Commission, and there's now a little bit of work that our provincial guys have done in, in cooperation with some other provinces. So if you're looking for technical background, we have a bit, we need more, and that's one of the things that we're saying going forward we need to do, and we've actually got funding requests in. We're working with the Federal Provincial Territorial Tourism Initiative to produce a guidebook specific to cultural tourism uh, in the vein of the one that, that uh, we've been talking about, transforming communities. Um, so we're, we're hoping to produce those over the next little while. We've only just got going on this. Um, we do have some technical background information. And if you'd like to send me an email, I can send you copies of that kind of stuff. Terrific. Thank you. Yeah. communities in rural British Columbia with something like a Juno, Juno initiative, meaning I, I get a lot of requests for helping Aboriginal communities keep their youth within their community, and in particular in entrepreneurship and, and running a small business. When you look at a 4,000 you know, 4, uh, population in, in, a, in a community like the Nishka, which is in northern British Columbia, it's not that big, and so they're looking at ways to create economic development within their own area, but one of the things that's, that's primarily important to them is, is retaining their culture, their art, and having their youth be a part of that. So I'm wondering how, how do we collectively know that that's going to be most likely tourism-based, 
And how does that affect uh, something like a Juno event, uh, if at all? First, okay, um, I want to, I wanna, um, first off, there, there are opportunities to use events in First Nations communities that are, can be really great. And the First Nations are actually, one of the areas that they're really strong in is organizing powwows and get-togethers. They're very good at that. Now, the challenge is that's working with friends and neighbors on an informal, friendly relationship. To put that on a business footing for tourism is, is a bit, it's going to take a little bit of work. But there are some steps to do it. Um, and one of them is that the Aboriginal community itself has started to really embrace music. The, the music scene in BC the last couple of years for First Nations, I'm blown away. It's fabulous. So maybe they need to do an Aboriginal, what was it, APTM, the, the Aboriginal Awards. They have an award ceremony. Maybe get it out of Toronto and have it, have it up in Michigan. <laughs> Go ahead. Well, I, I think recognize that uh, with respect to the Juno specifically, the Aboriginal component in Vancouver uh, was on the Tuesday night, I think, so five days before the event we all saw on television, um, in North Vancouver, West Vancouver. Yeah, at, at the reserve there. At, at the reserve. It was off-site. It was, I'm told, one of the most thrilling uh, musical get-togethers that anybody had ever seen. It just wasn't broadly shared beyond the hall that it was in. Um, part of the marketing function then has to be how do we embrace that glorious moment and spread it to the rest of the country in much the same way that we did with the opening ceremonies for the Commonwealth, Commonwealth the Olympics. Sorry, I'm still stuck, stuck in the Commonwealth case. But, you know, I think the sense of pride that we felt across Canada with an Aboriginal component in the opening that was really presented exceptionally well, we should be doing for all of it. So you're going to have to recognize that there has to be a strategy that allows local embracing, but also celebrating at the national level. That's uh, just an answer for you, but that's, that's the reality of how small communities might engage something like the Juno. Great, thanks. Paul uh, Redchenko, did you have a question? Hi, yes, I do. Um, I've got a question regarding the, uh, the pilot projects. Of the four that you've uh, mentioned there, is there a way that we can uh, be uh, up to date on those? It sounds, uh, all of them sound very interesting and, and different, uh, I guess, angles that you're proposing there. And the second part of the question is more specific with the, uh, the Alaska Highway one. Um, I'm currently working with our, uh, our provincial parks folks and looking at uh, enhancing the tourism opportunities uh, in our parks along the highway and I guess I would like to know a little bit more of uh, what you are doing and maybe we can work on some kind of uh, interprovincial type uh, connection there. I, I just point out we have April Moy, I think, uh, on the on the uh, call at the moment, and maybe she, uh, you know, might be able to make some comment about how things are going up there as well. Thanks, Brian, and thanks for the inquiry about the Alaska Highway and uh, thinking about working together. We. Um, we started. Um, we've just started the project, and uh, are looking within the Peace River Regional District area, and now are and now are looking to take it up uh, to the Northern Rockies uh, Regional Municipality. And uh, if you um, if you want to connect with me, um, I'd be more than happy to share more of the information about the project and how all the players can uh, can work together. If I can just add something to this, April is just finishing up a master's degree thesis on the topic, um, and that might be of some use. Uh, just as a side comment, there's a number of people uh, who are presently doing work which is associated, which is not specifically on uh, uh, community cultural tourism, but is associated with, with it, and, and there's a, a number of people, particularly within the ministry, who are involved in, in research, which we're hoping to make available. Uh, through Link BC, through the uh, Tourism Online Resource Center. So you can expect, in terms of resources and up-to-date information, which will help add to the, the case studies, which Bruce can maybe refer to, um, there's, there's opportunities there which are uh, for research, uh, which is going to be coming out within the next six months. So I'll, uh, that's something to keep in mind, and that's something we might be able to let you all know about uh, once these papers um, are, are available for reading. You got a connection there with uh, April, and, and if uh, if you'd like, you can also talk to me. I work with April on that project, and, and uh, we'd love to work with Albert on this. We're going to bring in Yukon, we're going to bring in Alaska, and we'd love to work with you. 
Sounds good. Uh, and uh, I guess April's contact will be made available after the uh, after the webinar. Yeah, or if you like, you can um, right click on her name on the attendees list and privately chat with her and exchange contact information that way immediately. Watch out, she'll have you going to Fort St. John in January. <laughs> well, I'm due for a trip, so it might be worth it. Hey, now, it's not all that bad, you guys. It's better than all the rain in Victoria. <laughs> <laughs> I think we deserve that one. <laughs> Thanks, Juan. So, Danielle Johnson, go ahead and pose your question. Yes, hi, I'm, I'm with the Caribou Regional District, um, and some may know that we were recently designated the fourth capital of Canada by the Canadian Forestry Association. Um, and one of our goals with that is to really promote the diversity of the forest industry, um, moving a little bit away from traditional saw milling and that sort of thing. We were at Beach Street, um, at the Richmond Ozone, um, doing ecotourism, promoting log home building, that sort of thing. And um, now what we're hoping to do is put together a little bit of like a geocaching, um, more of a passport of different places in our region that visitors can come go to like woodlot tours, um, birch syrup production in the North Caribou, which is into that agro-tourism, and these sorts of things. But we're finding that it's a little bit hard to get over the barrier that we're a local government um, starting this project versus um, a grassroots organization or a tourism organization. So we feel a little bit of reluctance for people to work with us because we are government. So we're wondering if anyone at the ministry might be able to help us guide us through these kinds of projects as we're forced capital for the next two years um, or provide advice to us or these sorts of things. Um, could I ask you to contact me offline and I'll be happy to help you with that. Um, it sounds like you've got a good thing and we should find a way to make it work. Fabulous. Thank you. And I'd like to point out that local governments actually are grassroots organizations. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. Sorry. Um, and he's on black. We'll have time for one last question from you. Hi there. I just uh, want to thank you as well for all your information that you've shared today. It's been wonderful. Um, my question is revolves around with the winding up of the cultural mapping and planning um, funding that went on with 210 Legacies Now, is there any thought of where funding may be replaced to work on these kinds of projects? It's a very good question, Yvonne. Uh, in fact, I'm uh, in a meeting tomorrow to talk to Lori Baxter from Legacies 2010 and, and my executive director. We hope to be able to carry on those programs from within the ministry, but it's, it's a bit early to say anything for sure. We, those are darn good programs and we don't want to lose them. We hope we can keep them going. Okay. Thanks so much, Bruce. We'll talk then. You bet. That was a lot of people. The icon that looks like three pieces of paper. There's three extra handouts there with additional information. If you wanted to download them now before we close this, it will be available on the Rural BC Secretariat website um, in about five to seven days. So uh, I just wanted to thank all the presenters for joining us today again, and very much to everybody on the line for questions and joining the discussion. Um, we will be following up with the survey that I mentioned earlier and really welcome any questions or questions. We're welcome to it. Worthwhile. Yeah. Yeah. I see a couple of people on the line still have a couple of questions, but unfortunately we've run out of time. So the presenter's information will be available and perhaps there will be an opportunity to follow up with them directly. Um, so we're going to sign off and say goodbye and thank you. Thanks. Bye. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Thank you. Bye.